um, a fire where there was a house and a fire, you'd have a decision to make. You'd, you could either grab a bucket of water, start doing the best you could to put that fire out, although it may seem overwhelming to you, or you could decide to go and get help in order to try and put the fire out. And that kind of illustrates uh, the kinds of missionaries that there are. There are those, like Peter and Melissa are going to be, that, that are going to go to the front lines and see the tremendous need that's uh, there in a country where there's less than one half of 1% that are, that are Christians. We've seen some, uh, some other surveys recently that are a little more encouraging than that, but still it's a place of, uh, where uh, most people have no concept of the gospel, who Jesus is, never heard his name, have no idea, nothing have ever heard it, never met a Christian before in their life. And it could seem like a big fire, and how can I possibly put that out? But there needs to be those that are there doing that. But at the same time, uh, there needs to be the ones that are, that are supplying the water, <laughs> that, are, that are calling attention uh, to. You know, we had uh, a young couple from our church that went to uh, uh, Pakistan a number of uh, years ago, right after we uh, uh, planted the church. And they went with a team of, of 13 was I had the opportunity to go and minister there and teach in the, the discipleship training school uh, with them, which was a, a very interesting experience, and uh, to be and see what their life was like there in a Muslim country. But uh, after about um, five years of, of being there and the birth of their, their daughter there and so forth, they were, that team of 13 was down to the two of them. And really they could no longer function in terms of running a discipleship training school and there was nobody on this side saying with a loud enough voice, they need help, they need prayer, they need uh, you know, reinforcements coming in and short-term workers and others to come alongside. So they basically needed to come back and, uh, and regroup. So in terms of missions, we need both. We need the people that will see the tremendous need be right there on the front lines. But in terms of missions, you can be involved in missions through prayer, through giving and calling attention to the need of a particular people group or, or country uh, somewhere around the world. But uh, we're all called to be involved in missions. We get that through the, what we call the Great Commission. Some people call it the Great Command found in Matthew 28. And we'll use this as our primary text this morning, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So the great commission or the great commands. Who is it for? Who received the great commission? Well, it was the, the apostles, it was the other disciples and believers that were, were there. This is after the uh, death and resurrection of, of Jesus, but again, consider who they were. They were pretty simple guys. But for the most part, they were just fishermen. <laughs> they lived a pretty simple life. Uh, you had, you had uh, Matthew that had those Levi jeans and uh, it was a tax collector and so forth. Uh, and you had kind of that, but uh, it was kind of a motley crew that were given this, this commission. Paul speaking of them and of himself later in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians uh, 126 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. This is why, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So God called the apostles and the other disciples to fulfill the commission. And... Um, it wasn't because they were the wisest or the mightiest or the most powerful. In fact, it was the opposite reason. God's looking for people that have no ambition of their own so that when he works through them, then he might get the glory. Uh, and that's, that's what we see in a classic example of, uh, of Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? 
uh, is a guy that's living in a day when Israel is being uh, tremendously oppressed by a lot of a lot of people around them, and in particular, in this time, the, the Midianites. And, um, and we find the, uh, an angel of the Lord coming to speak to him, and he's threshing his grain. Normally, you do that up on a hilltop. You would take a little, kind of like a pitchfork, throw it in the air. Wind would blow it, blow the chaff away. The grain falls in the ground. You've got your grain. Well, where's, he, uh, where's, he, where's he doing this? He's not up on a hilltop. He's in a wine press. He's in a hole <laughs> doing this. Interesting, and the uh, archaeologists that have uh, uh, uncovered uh, remains in this area, that's exactly what they found, deep pits where they could tell there had been threshing of grain down in them because of this period of time. So he's not in this hole because he's such a, a brave, mighty guy. <laughs> you get the idea. He's hiding out. And uh, in Judges 6, verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat under a... Uh, Terabith tree, which was uh, in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son, uh, while his son Gibeon, or Gideon, threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, "The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor." NIV says, <laughs> "Mighty warrior," not looking like a mighty warrior right now. You know, he's afraid, he's hiding out, and and so forth. But the angel sees something else, says something else to him. Gideon is a guy that was not ambitious. He's just trying to get by. Don't want to cause any trouble. Don't really feel like having all of the fruit of my labor of farming ripped off by the Midianites today. So I'm just going to kind of hide out here. But God says to him via the angel, that's not who I see you to be. I see you to be a mighty warrior, a man of valor. Because God was looking for somebody that was humble enough that he could use, and after he used him, God would get the glory for it. And uh, you remember the rest of the story where uh, Gideon is, uh, uh, to say the least, apprehensive about doing this, but he decides to go along with God's plan, and then he uh, gets a small army around him, and God says, it's too many, and God, God begins whittling it down to fewer and fewer people. Later it says, that the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. And here's why, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So I've got to get you down to where you only got a few hundred people. That way, when you go against them, you are so outnumbered that when I give the Midianites into your hands, you have victory over them. I'll get the glory for it and not you. And that's who God is looking to use today uh, in terms of sharing the gospel, in terms of so many other ways, but in particular in terms of, of missions. Later, even the people wanted Gideon and his son to rule over them. <clears throat> and he said, no, it's better if the Lord rules over you. So uh, the commission is given to the apostles who were just ordinary guys uh, and uh, the other believers and uh, the disciples that are there with him. Uh, at the end before his ascension, and, uh, and he chose them, Paul says, it's not because they were wise, it's not because they were mighty, it's, and they were not uh, uh, ambitious in any way. Gideon's kind of the classic example for us. What, what are the instructions? Well, and Jesus spoke to them, verse 18, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the instructions include authority. And the entire Gospel of Matthew stresses the authority of Jesus Christ in his teaching in Matthew 7, his healing in Matthew 8, forgiving sins in Matthew 9, his authority over Satan. And then he delegates authority to the other disciples in Matthew 10. Here he says, all authority or all power has been given to me so that I can send you out to fulfill this commission in the same way that he's, again, saying the same to each and every one of us. God's power is not uh, exhibited or seen through man's clever programs uh, it's seen through those that would seek to give glory to him. And that's why God uh, wants to work in and through our lives. Warren Wordsby says that Christianity is a missionary faith. The very nature of God demands this, for God is love, and God is not willing that any should perish. Our Lord's death on the cross was for the whole world. If we are the children of God and share his nature, then we'll want to tell the good news to the lost world. And, uh, and that should be true, certainly, uh, of not just those that we send out to the mission field, but each and every one of us fulfilling that commission that he's called us to do 
uh, because, again, we have his power to do it. Secondly, the instructions include uh, making disciples, kind of the classic uh, verse here in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, it's interesting in a Greek text, the emphasis is not on the go. The emphasis is on make disciples. The, uh, the, the go is a, a present participle. It just means going. While you're going, there's the assumption that you're going. You're just going about your life, going out into the world, wherever God would, uh, would lead you. And as you're going out there, you're to be making disciples. Now, <clears throat> we might translate that word disciple, apprentice. So it's not as you're going out into the world, get other people to make decisions. Sometimes that's our, our emphasis in, in terms of evangelism. And it's important for people to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And that's kind of the beginning, to admit that they need a, a Savior to forgive them of their sins and invite Christ into their lives. That's, that's the beginning point. But the great commission or the great command is to actually from that point then do what you can to invest and pour your life into them uh, and through the teaching of, and the sharing of God's word so that they'll grow up uh, and be mature in their, uh, in their faith. That's, uh, that's the idea of the Great Commission. Uh, how long should the commission take? Well, Jesus says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's, it's for all times. It's really for all believers. Uh, we've been given certain instructions about it. It's God's power uh, in it, working in our lives. We're to be discipling others as we're going, uh, and it's, uh, there's no end to it. Notice the phrase, the end of the age, which also indicates, indicates that, uh, that God's got a plan, he's, and he's working it out. And, of course, we've studied that plan. You know, he's, he's actually told us what's going to happen in the future, and as we went through the book of Revelation together, we, we know what's going to be happening in the future. We know some of the events that are going to be leading up to, to that culmination of all history, but the whole point is God is the God of all history, and he places us in it, and he gives us a plan each and every one for our lives. He doesn't call all of us to Japan, but he calls us all to something, uh, to a particular uh, group of people. And I have to tell you, one of the things that was, uh, one of the hardest things about going full-time in the ministry a number of years ago is that it took me out of a, an area of an influence uh, in, in the uh, art world where there's a tremendous need for a witness for Jesus Christ. I can just tell you, <laughs> there's, not a lot of, there's not a whole lot of born again Christians uh, uh, out there in, in that world. And God had given me favor. And when I would lecture at the University of Hawaii, somehow I found a way to have slides of windows, that, stained glass windows I've done in churches that have a picture of, of the cross on them. And I just felt the need to explain what that all meant to all those students for some reason. And then, hey, here's a dove uh, over here that I did. Let me explain what that means and the verse that it comes from. I mean, was, I had to do it, right? Same thing at the, the Honolulu Academy of Art or wherever the Lord would kind of give me uh, a, a venue. And uh, because, but, but I'm out of that world once, once I kind of went full-time uh, in the ministry. But you're still out there. You have your areas of influence, people that you know, your neighbors, those that you work with, people you go to school with. In a sense, that's your mission field. I've been tempted <coughs> to put up a sign uh, <coughs> there in the back that, uh, over the front door that says, now entering the mission field. I've seen that in, in a few churches because that's the idea. We come in and we celebrate what the Lord's doing uh, in our lives. And we get, uh, you know, built up in our faith through the word. And then we, we're all back out again uh, in, into the world. And it's a world that certainly needs for people to come along and make disciples. Well, who's the commission to reach? Well, that's in verses, that's verse 19. Make disciples of all nations. The word for nations here is in the Greek, ethnos, and uh, it really, it's where we get our English word, ethnic, and um, it just means a particular people group, and uh, if you study a little bit about missions and so forth, you know, they've got uh, great uh, maps and statistics of all of the people groups that have been reached, that have uh, the gospel in their own language, and the ones that haven't, but Jesus is calling us as believers, as the church, to go out into the world as we're going to make disciples and it's to be to all of the people groups of the world. 
kind of illustrate it this way. Because uh, our, our perspective would be like this, just an illustration. But if there was a shipwreck out at sea and there were hundreds of people uh, in their life jackets all scattered about and the current's going and they're being drifted apart and you happen to hear about it, you jump in your boat, you race out there. You might have a tendency to just go to the people that are closest to you to reach them and fill your lifeboat up the best you could with as many people as you could. You didn't have room for them all. You can't save them all. You'll save the, all the ones you can that are right there together. And uh, again, it's just an illustration. Don't feel guilty that you're not able to reach everybody. But uh, that's the, uh, that would be man's perspective on, on life saving. God's perspective would be this. You would get in your boat and you would drive out there and you would come to that first group and you would save some of them. You would drive over here to this group and you would save some of them. You would go to this group and you would save until you went to all of the groups and save some out of all of those groups. That's kind of shocking. Sure, that's God's perspective. That's God's perspective. He's telling us to go into all of the world because literally, why should Peter and Melissa go to Japan? Why would Vaughn and Isa go they'll subject their family to living in a place like, I can't say, but it's a place with landmines and uh, people running around that want to kill you because you're a Christian. Why would you take your family to a place like that? Because God is a missionary God and wants to save out of all of those different people groups. Because we could, from man's perspective, say, there's enough work to do right here. There's enough people to save, right? Are all the people in Kailua saved? Are all the people on Oahu saved? Well, certainly they're not all saved. Why bother to go anywhere else? Because that's the heart of God. That's the commission, that's the command to try to go out and attempt to save and get the gospel to every ethnic group that is out there on the planet. Again, it's, we're just part of it. It's not up to us. God's going to do it all in, in the end, and he's going to reach them in the end. And if you read through the Psalms, you'll see lots of references to this idea of what God is going to do. First, uh, Psalm 22, verse 27, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over nations. Psalm 86, 9, all nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And, and we could go on and on. I'll give you a couple of other references in your notes. And then we see the culmination in Revelation 7, 9. After these things I looked, John says, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So who are we to reach? It's, it's everybody that we possibly can. But specifically, he's called us to do what we can to go out to all of the ethnic groups around the world. Fortunately, it's, it's not up to us here in this little room, but the, the body of Christ around the world. And, uh, and again, if everybody is, is doing their part, we'll accomplish that. But even if we don't, God's going to do it during the tribulation, right? Because there's angels that are basically going to go around the planet preaching the gospel. There's going to be that 144,000 Jews that have a seal on them that protect them from all the tribulation that's going on, that are going to go out there preaching the gospel. God's going to get it done uh, in the end. But he asked us... If you're a disciple and a believer, then to, as you're going into the world, make disciples uh, of others. The model for the commission is, I think, found in Acts chapter 1-8. Last thing that we have from Jesus before his ascension, so probably pretty important. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here we have the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in terms of missions and this uh, commission that he's given all of us and uh, uh, not just those that go to the foreign mission field, but the Holy Spirit will come upon you uh, with power. And that word uh, uh, power is the word dunamis or, or where we get our word uh, dynamic. And uh, 
Uh, and it's a dynamic power that God's going to give us. The word witness is actually the word martyr. Sometimes we think of someone that is a martyr for their faith as someone willing to die for their faith. But it's somebody that's so committed to their faith, if necessary, they would die on behalf of others to share the gospel uh, to them. And, uh, and so hear the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in missions. In Luke chapter 24, verse 46 Jesus had said, then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Messiah, or Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on high. Uh, the disciples are there with Jesus. They've now witnessed his death, his burial, his resurrection. He has met with them in the upper room and breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. He had told them earlier, the Holy Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. But he says, now, before you go out to fulfill the commission, you need to wait in, uh, in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Uh, and of course, the context is nobody's hearing the gospel. Nobody's getting saved. None, nothing is happening. Uh, but he says it's so important that you receive the Holy Spirit with power to be able to do it. Why? Again, so that God might get the glory. It's not my strength or my ability. It's just the natural working of his spirit in and through my life. And, uh, and that's, that's really, really where it's at. I, I can just tell you the the first time I, re I remember this so specifically, uh, is, is anybody real nervous about sharing their faith with other people? I mean, you know, or some, it's like, no, it's just no problem. I'm just, you know, I'm standing in the hood of my car and just, you know, yelling at people. Pre I just, no problem. No, most people, it's kind of it's a big issue. I know it was a big issue for me because after all, they might, they might give me a mean look or something. You know, we face just tremendous, you know, pressure here, you know. Someone might say, I'm not... I just don't want to hear that right now. You know, it would really hurt our feelings. And so we're really stressed out about the idea of sharing our faith. But I can remember <coughs> having um, Pastor Bill pray for me and uh, believing the Holy Spirit, you know, had come upon me and I had that power. And I just didn't think anything of it. And then we were, we were out, uh, Kathy and I, doing a crafts fair the next weekend. And I found myself sitting under <coughs> one of those big banyan trees down there at Thomas Square talking to a very good friend of mine who happened to be Jewish and was a, one of the really excellent woodworker uh, here in the island. Uh, he's, so uh, he's Jewish. He's uh, very intellectual. He's a stockbroker. I'm just saying he's the last guy I'd be telling Jesus about. You, you know what I'm saying? If I, would, if I was plan this in my own mind, I, you know, I'd maybe pick like an eight-year-old kid or something. You know what I mean? Just you know, kind of start with somebody on my own intellectual level or something. You know, but... <laughs> But here I am. He's just in conversation with me, concerned about his son and this or whatever. And, and I just like, well, you know, I think he probably just needs the Lord. You know, God's really changed my life. And I'm just going, and it's like, I'm just rattling on, you know, for like 20 minutes. And I get down, I go back over to where my stained glass booth was. And I'm just like, wow, I just, I think I just witnessed to that guy and shared the gospel with him. It's like, what's gotten into me? You know, but it was just, it's just the Lord. It's just the, the fruit of his spirit working in uh, and through our lives. And missions, our mission, their mission can't be accomplished apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and God doesn't want to accomplish it in another way, through man's programs or somebody's particular giftings and so forth, because he, again, in the end, he wants people to say, and we want to be able to say, to God be the glory, great things that he has done. Well, the Holy Spirit is poured out on them in Acts 2, and then the instructions in the model for us, you to start right in your own town, right where you're at. Jerusalem, for us, that would be, that would be Kailur, whatever city you're from or that you, you live in. That's where we begin, again, this model of ministry. And we would call that evangelism in terms of sharing our faith with other people. Uh, and then it would be uh, Judea, which, again, is that southern part of Israel, uh, again, as they went to that area, same culture, same language, uh, it would still be maybe like other people on Oahu that we would uh, meet. And then Samaria kind of jumps. Now we're crossing over into missions because uh, to them in that Jewish context, they were not Jewish. 
uh, and it would be a whole different thing. Although language, they would still be okay to speak to them, but culturally it would be different. Maybe that's like the Outer Islands. <laughs> that's probably where you live here. Uh, but uh, uh, it can be different in, uh, in some places, even uh, here in the islands. Same language, same everything, but it's kind of you have a diff little different uh, culturally and so forth. That would be like uh, our Samaria. And then to the, uh, to the ends of the world would, uh, for us, that's anytime you get on an airplane <laughs> from, from Hawaii, we're the most isolated island, uh, island group uh, on, the, on the planet. But uh, that's, that's the model. There's where we begin, right where we live, uh, then to the surrounding areas, and, and then to the uttermost uh, parts of the world. And, and we can do it in a lot of ways, and we're thankful for uh, the technology that allows uh, uh, guys that work very hard to put us on, uh, on the radio uh, every week, and that goes out throughout Oahu, and then through the, uh, through the internet, through the, the guys that work so hard uh, doing that, the Olelo broadcast, and uh, and so forth, and now uh, one of the churches on Kauai, uh, one of the Calvary's there that has a, a radio ministry is putting us on over there and stuff, and that's, that's wonderful, I mean, to reach in that way, but uh, by and large, you know, people, people can hear uh, the gospel in, in those ways and uh, be taught the word of God, but they really need somebody flesh and blood to be living it out before him, uh, before them, and therefore the necessity uh, that, uh, that we go into the ends uh, of the earth. A couple of things that, um, that we've done in terms of uh, missions over the, over the years that I think have been, uh, been very helpful. And, uh, and uh, if your kind of ears are kind of perked up in this uh, to some, some degree as far as how you can be involved in, in missions, one is that you can just simply get a map and, and uh, tape it to your refrigerator, put it on the wall, bulletin board or something. And just, uh, just the fact that you, you look at, at the world and begin to think about all of the different groups of people out there that have never heard the gospel. And uh, lots of great material available through you, uh, through the Center for World Missions, YWAM, and uh, other missions organizations that'll help tell you a little bit about different people groups and how you can pray for them. Uh, that's a, a, a very uh, practical thing to do. Uh, you can uh, g go back to our little missions board there and just get a prayer card and adopt a, a missionary in that sense to, to pray for them. They, they faithfully write their newsletters. There's always a prayer list at the end. Uh, and you can read those letters and pray for them. Uh, and then uh, hopefully, God willing, you might be able to meet some of them someday. I have to tell you, though, some of them have been on the mission field so long and are so underfunded, it's difficult for them to get back to the islands. And they've just been there for years. We've got missionaries that we've supported that have been on the mission field now for 20 years. Uh, and they, they don't make it back home very often. And, uh, and so they need your prayers. They need your, uh, your support. <clears throat> just to email them, drop them a card. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how much uh, it would mean to, you, uh, to them. I was uh, on a trip to, uh, to India uh, years ago, 15, 16 years ago, and I, there was a, a buddy of mine that from Calvary Honolulu was a postman in, in Kaimuki, and, and uh, you know, the Lord had saved his life. He was beginning to teach Sunday school, and he was a single guy and just thought, hey, man, I think I'll, you know, join YUM and do a discipleship training school and head off to the mission field for a couple of months and just kind of see what it's like, and, and, uh, and he did that 20 uh, some years ago, and he's He's still there, but we had lost uh, contact. I wasn't sure he was. I thought he was in southern India, and I called a guy who called a guy who called a guy and said, yeah, he's actually in Madras, and, and uh, I, uh, so I thought, oh, great, you know, I'm going to send a fax to uh, that uh, fax number that I had saying I was going to be there. Didn't know if it would go through, reach anybody, jumped on a plane, went to a lot of other places. Finally, a, a couple of weeks later, I'm in Madras, uh, I've got a day off finally, and the guy takes me to the address where that missions training school was, and I walk in, and, and, and there he is. And I hadn't seen him in a number of years. <clears throat> we had a great time of uh, fellowship with him and, uh, and his wife, and took him out to lunch and so forth. started talking to him, how are you guys doing? And he says, wow, well, we're doing great, praise God. Tell me all the, and uh, it's fun talking to these guys, I mean, because he's kind of like Vaughn too. These guys hiked the hills in Nepal, and they fed the police chase them, and then the, all the Indiana Jones run across those rope bridges with, you know, 80-pound packs of tracks on their back as they're handing them out. Uh, this kind of missionary guy stuff that, uh, that uh, we're used to being uh, exposed to and stuff. And so he's just a, a great guy. 
So he's living there. He's living in the back. Him and his wife are living in the back bedroom of somebody's house. They're eating there at the training center. And they don't have a dollar to their name. They're just trusting God each and every day. Fortunately, it doesn't take much to live in India. But, uh, and so, and, but you know, they just had the joy of the Lord. I, I gave them all the rupees I had in my wallet at the time, came back. We started to support them. I called a couple other churches, but you know, they didn't care. They're just out there trusting God, serving. The, these are the kind of people that we're, that we're, that we're talking about. They're going to go whether anybody supports them or not and just, and just trust, trust the Lord. So it's important. Hey, get a prayer card. Pray for, you start reading those newsletters and you get to know them a little bit, get to be a picture and a personality. Uh, it adds a lot of meaning to your to your prayers. That's a way that you can be uh, involved. Occasionally, uh, read a biography about a great missionary. And there's some wonderful ones out there. And there's some that uh, if you're not a reader, get the ones for kids. You know, you can read those babies real quick, you know. Read them out loud to your kids so they can learn about missions. Of course, they might go someday. See, I did that. But uh, <laughs> you can also say, if you don't eat all your vegetables, you know, you can't go on a missions trip because when you go into another culture, you've got to be able to eat everything. So that... That uh, kept our kids' diet uh, pretty healthy, uh, you know, all the way through. And uh, that first mission trip, Josh was 12, Melissa was 14. It's like, I forget where we were or what we were eating somewhere in some uh, little uh, hole, in hole, yeah, hole in the wall place in China. And uh, it's like, they don't speak English. We don't speak Cantonese. We're just kind of like, yeah, bring us some food here. And we hope there's not a raw egg on it. <laughs> Because mine was, and everybody else was really sweating it after that. But, uh, uh, you know, they just yeah, teach them uh, about, uh, about missions through the lives of these godly men and women that we have the record of. And it will inspire you. And I, I, I do that every... I just went back and reread uh, about all the missionaries that first came to the Hawaiian Islands. And it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story. They were so dedicated uh, to come when they did. And, uh, and this is just some great stories to read. And then consider going on, on a short-term uh, missions trip. You know, we go every couple of years to China. The kids go to Japan. <clears throat> Our trips to China may have a layover in Japan from now on. I'm, I'm kind of I'm I'm, I'm sensing that. You know what I'm saying? I'm sensing the leading of the Lord that it would be a really good idea to have a little stopover in Japan on the way to <coughs> Hong Kong and may, maybe even on the way back. But... Uh, uh, we go and we, we take the kids and, and uh, take adult smuggle Bibles into, uh, into China. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's just so great. One of the uh, ladies was sharing with me after the uh, first service house. She goes, you know, I've never been outside the United States. and never even thought about going. Uh, I said, well, pray about it, you know, and how the Lord might, might use you. Peter in the first service... Uh, uh, when he was leading worship, uh, we did one of the songs that we normally did, but sang it in, uh, he put it up in Ramaji, which is uh, Japanese, but spelled out in English letters. If, if you're used to the pronunciation a little, and you can learn it pretty quick, uh, then you can just, you know, we we're able to sing along, you know, in Japanese, but, in which was fun. Uh, but to do that in a Japanese church with a bunch of other, other believers who have it a lot more difficult than, than we will ever have in terms of living out their faith in their neighborhoods with their Buddhist families who have rejected them because of their stands for the gospel and, uh, and sing along with, with them. It's, very, it's, very, it's still very moving to me. I started thinking about it. I get a little bit. <clears throat> I've had a few little meltdowns in, uh, in Japan just worshiping uh, with, uh, with those guys. It's, uh, it's meaningful. And, and it changes you and it changes your outlook. And we see, we see an example of that again in the book of Acts when Philip first takes the gospel. Remember, it was to be Jerusalem, Judea. They did that. Philip goes up to Samaria. They're cross-cultural now, and uh, same language. They can speak to them. A great revival happens. Uh, of course, they, they weren't real big on the Samaritans <laughs> and vice versa. Like, they didn't ever go there. And uh, if they ever even went to that area when they came out, they would shake all the dust off their, off their robes and stuff so they don't have any of that Gentile dust on them. And so they were weary, of, leery of what was going on. So they sent Peter and John to investigate. And they go up and they check it out. And they went, man, this is totally the Lord. And then it says on the way back, they preached to the villages and the towns as they left. They didn't do it on the way up there, but on their short-term missions trip, God changed their heart because they saw the gospel 
alive and at work in, a, in another group of people they never considered it ever possible that they could be saved and that God would work in their lives. And it changed them on the way back, which leads to then Peter going and staying out on the, uh, the Mediterranean with a guy named Simon the Tanner. And it's not because he had a surf shop, although there's some surf there. Uh, and, uh, and he would have never stayed there before, I think, as a good Jewish kosher boy, because what does the tanner do? He handles dead animals. He's unclean. He's got to live outside of town, uh, and, uh, and nobody normally would want to associate with him. Peter's eyes have been opened to something greater than the gods, <coughs> greater than, than the cultural values, and now he's staying at this guy's house. I don't know if you've ever thought about That was a radical thing. That leads to him going to Cornelius' house preaching the gospel. God can use short-term trips to really open our eyes <coughs> to the gospel. And besides, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> Did I mention that? We have, we have a pretty good time. Why be involved in missions? Uh, it's because we're commanded to. It blesses the heart of God. And uh, the great uh, missionary to India and Persia, Henry Martin, once said that the spirit of Christ is in the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. Reading through Oswald Chambers uh, just the, uh, the other day, Kathy was uh, reading to, uh, this to me, thought it was very good. And uh, it's his devotion from January 14th from Isaiah 6, 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And uh, he, he writes, uh, won't read the whole thing, but uh, I thought it was very interesting what uh, Chambers uh, observes about this. Uh, God did not lay a strong compulsion on Isaiah. Isaiah was in the presence of God, and he overheard the call and realized that there was nothing else for him but to say in conscious freedom, here I am, send me. Get out of your mind the idea of expecting God to come with compulsions and pleadings. When our Lord called his disciples, there was no irresistible compulsion from outside. The quiet, passionate insistence of his follow me was spoken to men with every power wide awake. If we let the Spirit of God bring us face to face with God, we too shall hear something akin to what Isaiah heard. The still small voice of God and in perfect freedom will say, here I am, send me. I like that. It's not, you know, we're not, uh, Chamber says, don't wait for some booming voice out of heaven to tell you to do something here. It's just like when you're with the Lord and the closer you draw to the Lord, as Henry Martin says, and you're in the presence of God, I like that. You'll overhear him say, you know, who, who will go? Who shall I send? And it's just kind of a, hey, how about me? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the idea. It's not, it's not this pleading. It's just, here, here's, here's something, you know, that's close to the heart of God. Uh, and that's, that's the idea. And I like that quote. Uh, Pastor Chuck, I heard a number of years ago, saying that if you want to get close to the heart of God, then get into missions because missions is the heart of God. He's a God of love, and it's not his will that any should perish but all should come to eternal life. If we're moving in that direction, well, if we're just moving closer to God, we're moving in that direction is the idea. So the Great Commission, uh, who's it given to? A bunch of bubbling idiots, basically. You know, but they're able to pull it off because of the instructions that's given them, which includes the authority that Jesus gives and his power and the power of his spirit working in us. And then we can be like a Gideon that... You know, we may be hiding out, threshing our grain and afraid of the Midianites, but, uh, you know, God shows up and says, oh, great warrior. Who, me? <laughs> and, and he calls us to go. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's just, it's exciting. And that's how the Christian life is to be lived, I think. Once again, I pour out my heart. For I know that you hear every cry You're listening No matter what state my heart is in You are faithful to answer The words that are true And I hope that it's real As I feel your 
Jesus, I'm 